So this morning's topic is silence, and it seems odd to talk about it. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to get <laughs> All week long it's like, it's, it's silence, wouldn't it be just more effective to just stand there? <laughs> and let you have an experience? <laughs> It's an interesting concept, this thing called silence. And one of the most animated and fun conversations that I had in ministerial school probably looked like an argument um, with Reverend Kim Kaiser over whether or not it's even possible for us to experience true silence. Um, and as much as I don't want to admit that he's probably right, he probably <laughs> is. <laughs> that it isn't possible. That in human form, for us to really experience true silence is really not possible. Because that would require us to completely release all meaning to language. Because silence is more than sound. Silence literally comes, there's five, in, it has its roots in five different Hebrew words, in two different Greek words, the bulk of which go to the definition of dumbness. And they're not talking about stupidity. They're talking about the absence of words. They're talking about the interruption of speech. And while I can interrupt my verbal speech, quite easily, I just stop talking. It's the internal speech where all the noise is. <laughs> Anybody else have that? <laughs> so, just, just me. <laughs> and sometimes, again, maybe it's just me, I find that the louder and more discomforting the internal dialogue is, the more I talk out here. Trying to distract myself from my own internal dialogue. Because... While I'm really well versed at changing the external dialogue, the internal dialogue seems to have been well established before I even knew it was there. So changing it is just that difficult. I feel like I'm changing something that isn't even mine. I feel, you know, it's like I turn off the tape recording, and then I go, and there it is again. It's like, who turns you back on? <laughs> and then I think I re-record a new message, and it plays for a little while, and then all of a sudden, the old tape is running. And I thought it had been removed from the player and destroyed. Anybody else have that? <laughs> that bit? Where... This is still here feeling. Okay. We are one. And this is where the oneness of our collective consciousness for me becomes the most challenging. Because the, the human part of me just wants to go, please get your act together and quit thinking stuff that gets in my mind. Would you just stop? And in all fairness, you get to say the same thing to me. But that's part of what's happening. See, we're just experiencing the singularity of this individualized thought. We're experiencing the generations of all thought 
from the beginning of thought at the same time. Wonder why we're confused. <laughs> Could be there's a lot of chaos going on in there. So how do we actually get to this idea of silence? How do we actually get at least a momentary freedom from the noise. And it's going to be different for all of us. I wish I could, you know, just reach behind the Christmas tree here and pull out that magical gift and go, but boom, here it is, one size fits all. Doesn't exist. <laughs> just had a memory of Deborah and I were up at, uh, I think it was the Victorian Christmas celebration up in Nevada City, and there was a woman who sells socks. And I was so appreciative of the label on her socks that was honest enough to say one size fits most. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of one size fits all, one size fits most. And so meditation is helpful for most, but not all. Fishing is helpful for some, not most. <laughs> it was helpful for most. It would be really too crowded to be helpful for anybody. <laughs> so those of us who fish are glad it doesn't work for those of you who it doesn't work for. <laughs> What's really important is you find what works for you. And the way you do that is to try different things. <coughs> and to try it gently. How many have tried meditation only to, within the first 30 seconds, hate it? <laughs> <laughs> we can be slow to judgment if we choose. It could be that it's horribly uncomfortable because it's brand new. There are times when you go shopping and you get an amazing pair of shoes. And they're wonderful and you love them and they're going to be perfect with that outfit. And about 20 minutes into it, it's like, ow. <laughs> Because they didn't hurt in the store. Why are they hurting now? Well, now I'm having an experience with it that's a little longer. <laughs> Meditation works the same way. The more you stick with it, my personal experience is the more uncomfortable it got for a while. Because the more it challenged all the noise in my head that I was used to. The more I stayed in the practice of meditation, the more it challenged my comfort zone, the more it challenged my accepted normal, if you will. The longer I stayed in the silence, I thought the silence was painful. It wasn't. It was the noise that was painful. And it was the absence and the interruption of my noise that really threatened me. Because somewhere inside of me had aligned my identity with all of the beliefs that operate quite silently in my head until I stop them. <laughs> and here's what I learned from that. Absence of awareness does not equal silence. Let me say that again. Absence of awareness does not equal silence. And I thought it did, because I wasn't aware of the beliefs that were operating quite loudly 
inside me. Quite definitively, with authority, this is who you are operating in there. But I was so used to it, I didn't hear it anymore. Just because I've stopped being aware of hearing it doesn't mean it's silent. It just means I no longer need to pay attention. Just like when you drive your car, there was a time when we were younger where we actually had to pay attention to that activity, where we were conscious that I have the keys. There was excitement that we even got a hold of the keys. And then there was excitement putting them in the ignition and turning it. And now it's mindless. Unless we forget where our keys are. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Out to the truck this morning. Hmm. Can't open the door. I'll probably get further if I go back and get some keys. <laughs> so now it's in my awareness. That's how the silence actually begins to work when we participate in it. It interrupts the automatic languaging that's going on in our head. And what's uncomfortable is the interruption, not the silence. The silence is where we find our spirit. The silence is where we meet the divine that lives within us. And I had this journey really over the past month of how to language this idea of silence being the absence of language and still being able to hear my soul speak to me in a still small voice. Because that requires the very same language that I'm attempting to <clears throat> get away from. Herein lies a big part of the challenge. What's my soul's voice and what's my voice in the human level? Turn it down a little bit. Thank you. Which is which? Because understanding the difference between the two can be very challenging when they sound similar. My experience is this. My soul voice tells me things that my human voice has a challenge hearing. <laughs> you catch that? The soul voice is that one that says, go to ministerial school. When the human voice is going, have you looked at our bank account? Have you looked at my schedule? And the deep internal voice doesn't argue. It simply repeats, go to ministerial school. That still small voice inside that says, say yes to whatever it is. And everything on the human level is like, um, God, hello? Do you have a supervisor I can speak to? <laughs> <laughs> and the only response you get is an even quieter, more gentle, say yes. It's that place that scares our humanity because we can't see the possibility that our soul knows is probable. See, we, we, we like saying that we live in infinite possibility as an idea, but as a way of life, not so much. <laughs> not so much. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a thing. Okay. I like my routine. I suspect you do too. And yet, 
this idea of living in the possibility of continuous creation demands that we only slow down to experience our comfort zone. That we not stop and that we certainly do not build a condo. <laughs> but many of us do, myself included. Because, and especially with this age thing that happens. You know, I have this voice in my head that says, you need to be slowing down. And I have this nudge that lives right about here that says, move. I want it to say, why? I really do, because I want to argue with it. Because <laughs> I have some silly notion that I can win the argument. And that's my ego. It's that part of me that is gloriously human. I couldn't be here without it. None of us could, so please love your ego. You, you can't be here without it. You need it. And we need to learn how to work with it so that it doesn't limit us. How to dance with it to music that it can't hear, but we hear. <clears throat> So that when we leave this planet, I don't know about you, but my goal is, as I'm sliding out of here to wherever it is I'm going next, that I have no regrets. That I have nothing that, I, that comes to mind that is, I wish I had fill in the blank. Now that's a tall order. It's a tall order, and it's a scary order in human terms. Because my ego wants to cocky, you know, it's like, you can't afford to do that, I'm sorry? You don't have enough time to do that? Yeah, that's a great idea, you should have started when you were 20. <laughs> See, my ego has all the reasons why it won't work. <coughs> and my soul just whispers, come here, come here. And I invite you to consider that we don't have to know where here is to follow that voice. That when creation was birthing itself, it didn't know where here was. It just started creating and let go. And maybe, maybe, we can begin to let go. To not be so scripted. To not be so goal-oriented that we block possibility. That we can actually position ourselves to be surprised at the magnificence of our own life. I'm going to share this quote. I have a whole bunch of them here, but the only one that really... <coughs> Ernest Holmes in This Thing Called You says this. When a problem confronts you, take it into the silence of your consciousness. Now, he's talking about the one consciousness. He's not talking about the silence of your awareness. He's talking about absolute consciousness. Instead of thinking about the problem, think of the answer. God does not have problems. Therefore, the divine mind is the answer to every human problem. <coughs> Principle, never have problems. Principles never have problems. Problems are solved by bringing them under the control of principles. 
The problem is dissolved as the principle flows through it to the correct answer. So maybe, just maybe, the problem is simply a directional sign to the answer that you didn't know you made. Let's take this into prayer. So what I know in this one infinite beingness is that I am in its company every breath. That it is the very thing that beats my heart, that dreams my dreams. It is the essence of my life. It is truly all that I am. And so every need, every imagining that I have is already in me, answered, fulfilled. And that I am simply here to experience the fulfillment of creation as me. And so I speak my word claiming and affirming an opening to that on a breath to breath basis. That I open to a deeper, more active awareness of the consciousness within me that knows exactly who I am, that knows exactly who every expression of itself is. And so I lean into that truth in every interaction with the core of my being and the core of each being that I encounter. Knowing that it is the activity of the divine, meeting the divine, having conversations and interchanges with the divine. It can be no other way. That there is never a problem to solve, only a direction to follow to a greater expression of divinity. Grateful to know the truth of how it works and grateful to surrender to the law, to that process, <laughs> and just enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. Grateful, grateful, grateful. Mm -hmm. And so it is in this gratitude that I release my word into the activity of love and law that has already made it so. And I invite you, if any of this is true for you, that you join me by claiming it as we say together. Mm -hmm. And so it is. <laughs>